Uh, thanks again, guys. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about a project that we did, an airborne ladder project that we, we did for the Texas Department of Transportation. This project is State Highway 349, and it's located out in West Texas. Uh, basically, to give you a short project overview, uh, the project consisted of a 200-foot wide corridor along an approximately 48-mile section of SH 349 in West Texas. Um, fairly open country, fairly um, linear project uh, without a lot of obstructions along the uh, right of way. Uh, this project was comprised of both LIDAR, uh, low altitude LIDAR from a helicopter, digital aerial photography that was actually also captured at the same time, and then we did some HDS scanning. Uh, you'll see a bridge overpass there is one of the overhead features that obscured from the from the aerial perspective. And then, of course, some conventional ground survey that was both uh, control and is ground truthing for the for the LIDAR data. Ultimately, this data was used by TxDOT to support engineering design for uh, highway improvements. A little background about the system that we used. Uh, you see there's a helicopter we have there. A helicopter uh, it's a Ranger, Bell Ranger 206. The LiDAR sensor is inside the aircraft. There's a hole cut in the bottom. Um, we use a Trimble Hair 68i LiDAR system that's also uh, outfitted with a 60 megapixel medium format digital camera. It's part of the uh, project specifications. We flew and collected LiDAR data at a, a, an altitude above mean terrain of 225 meters. The uh, LiDAR point density was approximately 45 points per meter, which is some pretty dense data as far as airborne LiDAR goes. Uh, swath width, you can see there, was approximately 260 meters, which is a function of altitude. You're going to get the height you fly. It's going to give you the same corridor width. And uh, just as a side note, we captured approximately 3.1 billion LiDAR points uh, in the execution of this project, which translate into about 38 gigabytes of last files. And that's, that does not include the, uh, the aerial imagery that was captured as well. And with this, the LiDAR was used for the development of the DTM. The, the, the requirement for this was to get survey grade uh, mapping positions and uh, applying at this low altitude with this point density using supplemental ground control. Uh, those, those, that combination of uh, specifications the expectation was we would achieve uh, sub-tenth of a foot positioning both horizontal and vertical. Uh, kind of you see here in the screen, uh, these are some of the actual test results of the 109 control points that we, we captured as part of the execution of this project. Uh, we had an RMSE root mean square equivalent for the Z of three, approximately three hundredths of a foot. And, um, you can see that according to National Map Factor Standards, at a 90% confidence level, uh, we achieved plus or minus four hundredths of a foot vertical. And if you use the ASPRS and NSSDA action standards, at a 95% confidence level, plus or minus five hundredths of a foot. Now, this process that you see here, that you know, checking the control and comparing that, uh, this is a process that we vetted um, several years back. We, we've owned uh, a mobile system for three years. We've been providing airborne ladder services for the last several years. But as part of our mobile system, uh, we had projects where we com com collected data using conventional photogrammetry, and we, and we had also that same project that was south of uh, Austin, Texas, uh, the project we did for the Texas Department of Transportation. And we, so we had, we had airborne uh, photogrammetry, we had mobile, and we had on-the-ground surveys. And just being expert measures, you know, that's what surveyors are, part of what we, did, we wanted to do was prove to ourselves uh, two things. One, that using a superior methodology that we could check, you know, our LIDAR systems, both mobile and airborne, to ensure that we were meeting the actual specifications. And secondly, we wanted to ensure that we could get repeatability of positional accuracy. So this process had been vetted and tested by us on a local project, again, and uh, we're very satisfied with the results. And as a result of that, we've done some projects for the DOT here in Texas, um, you know, where they can convince themselves, and then this becomes an out. This this particular project 
is airborne application using those same standards of practice uh, to ensure that we meet the actual requirements. As I mentioned earlier, this, this project, uh, we also captured uh, aerial imagery with, our, with a 60 megapixel camera, which is integrated into the, to the LiDAR system. Oh, approximately 1,500 aerial images were captured uh, at, that, at that size cam camera with a ground sample distance of one inch. So this is some very uh, dense imagery. Uh, some, some of you will probably work with digital orthophotos. It may have uh, quarter foot contour or quarter foot pixel resolution to half foot pixel resolution. So when you see imagery like this, you really, really see a lot of detail. In addition to that, this was collected at a 6% overlap, and we controlled that with ground control and used that imagery to collect, to do planimetric feature extraction as part of stereo compilation process. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we, uh, another one of the tools that we incorporated into the execution of this project was terrestrial scanning. Um, as you can imagine, when you collect from an airborne perspective, you're looking nadir or down in a down position. So anything under something, as you see here, is an overpass. Uh, that becomes an obscured perspective. So you've got to be able to collect that kind of imagery or data uh, with a supplemental technology. Here we use a Leica Scan Station C10. It's a time of flight scanner. Uh, we, we've been using that type of technology for, oh my gosh, the last 14 years uh, through its various evolutions. Uh, as you can see here, this basically four setups, and we got a very dense uh, scan uh, data set, about 1,100 points per square meter. And uh, of course, that's extremely dense data, but it was more than sufficient to collect all the visible uh, bridge elements that were required. When it comes to making all these things work together, uh, one of the, the foundation is a, a good control network. Um, as part of the execution of this project, we use the TextDot VRS network. Um, in essence, we establish a primary control point every um, every three miles, which gets about 15 points across the project. Aerial control was a, was a point every one mile. For this is for the airborne lidar. In essence, we had 53 panel pairs. For a total of 106 points, um, four points at the Bridgela overpass location for the HDS scanning, and then we collected flow line elevations at drainage structures along the project, and then GPS again was used to collect, RTK GPS was used to collect the cross sections for the aerial ground truthing. Something I'd like to point out is that in the execution of a traditional photogrammetric project for one foot mapping, that we, and we, we've been doing that type of work for many, many years. Um, you would have a pair of, uh, or maybe a band of panels uh, every approximately 1,500 feet. Um, as you can imagine, that's about four per mile. And if you multiply that times the 40 miles, um, or four bands per mile times 40 miles, 160 times three, uh, 480 points versus 106 panel pairs. So that, that translates into a tremendous cost savings just on the control point, from the control point perspective. Of course, kit collecting with, with terrestrial, with traditional survey, with the, with the digital orthos and extracting planimetric from the stereo mapping and then the airborne LIDAR. Uh, as you can see in this data integration slide, uh, we had a very, this is a, you're looking at an airborne data set, so you have a, a data void. It's very evident in that black area where there's no pixels present. Uh, what you see now on this slide is the merged HDS data was collected with the terrestrial scanner and then the aerial LIDAR data. Uh, and then it's all colorized using the aerial photography. Lot of our data points by nature, just data points. Uh, here we're able to geo-reference the pixels from the aerial photography. You can colorize the uh, lot of data points, and as well from the from the uh, HDS laser scanner. As far as data extraction, um, keeping this in, in line with the theme of data integration. From the, from the lot of data, we collected and produced a digital terrain model, which consisted of the break lines and mass points. Mass points were extracted from the LIDAR, and then uh, we, had, we supplemented that with break lines in a quasi-stereo environment. Uh, and then also, we, the overhead uh, electric transmission distribution line crossing data was extracted from the, from the LIDAR data set. 
as with respect to the terrestrial scanning, uh, features that were extracted were the bridge abutments and the concrete riprap, column locations and their diameter, the beams and bends and low chord elevations, uh, edge of pavement and the crown of road, and of course median barriers, curbs, concrete medians, the guard fences, and uh, et cetera. Also on aerial photography, from that we developed inch to 50 scale planimetric mapping. That was integrated with the water data and the terrestrial scan data. And of course for the conventional survey there was the project and aerial control, um, apparent right of way, and then the culvert flow lines. What you see in this data extraction is uh, the LIDAR and the extracted 3D CAD data. So you see the CAD data draped in a 3D forum over the LIDAR data. In the lower right hand corner you see what most of you is uh, expected for your design engineering side of the transportation world. You would see something that's represented in a traditional microstation file format. Just by way of comparison between traditional methods versus the LIDAR HDS photogrammetry approach, uh, you can see that, as I mentioned earlier, the targets for the photogrammetry was 378 targets versus 106 targets. Um, that in itself was a very significant number when it comes to cost for the project. The primary project control, 162 points at the 1500 foot spacing, as I mentioned, and then you look on that LIDAR HDS photogrammetry side, 15 points at, at, at an interval spacing of three miles. And then here's something that will really, I think, should get your attention is the data collection time from a traditional method would have been 100 plus days in the field of a uh, you know, survey field crew working on the ground collecting that data versus uh, data collection time of five days with a LIDAR HDS photogrammetry approach. And what you get out of that, the project coverage on a traditional method, 1,200 foot wide corridor, versus a project coverage on LIDAR HDS approximately, we collected 850 feet, we only extracted and mapped a 200 foot wide corridor. If you look at the bottom, sum it all up, cost approximately 625,000 for a traditional method versus a cost of about 412,000 for the LIDAR HDS photometric solution. And kind of to wrap all this up, things to consider, um, you know, from a safety perspective, and I know we're all should be very cognizant of safety considerations, execution of our work in the field, but no, we had no, from, the, from using the HDS, everyone lied our photogrammetric solution, we, we didn't put personnel working in the right of way. And also, more importantly, we, no, I, I say more importantly, but very important, we were, there were no lane closures uh, required during the data acquisition phase. And I know some of you in the transportation business, um, some of you in the transportation business, uh, you know, that, that there's a significant cost to, to lane closures. Uh, that, that was not factored into the cost that we presented earlier. But it, it, does, it can be a very significant cost. As far as um, the survey, you know, the accuracy of the data, um, as I showed in the report earlier, we were able to achieve a survey grade data accuracy. That is what's required by the design engineers. Uh, we're very comfortable that whether it's mobile, airborne, or HDS, or a combination of those technologies, we're able to integrate those together and produce survey grade data accuracy as long as you have adequate um, project control. Uh, of course, you know the very high density of the data sets. Um, and then, of course, I, I mentioned earlier that another benefit is the reduction in the field acquisition time. Uh, I've got a question that kind of maybe circle back and talk about accuracy um, differences. Uh, from a photogrammetric perspective, uh, historically we, we, we produced a lot of that kind of work. Uh, for one foot mapping, generally the accuracy is plus or minus a quarter of the contour interval on well-defined points. So if you're within uh, a quarter of a foot, uh, horizontal or vertical accuracy, um, that, that's been acceptable. With um, of course, that aerial mapping photogrammetry work has always been supplemented with on-the-ground information. Uh, what we have here is a uh, the cost savings due to the efficiency of the collection, uh, and we're able to produce uh, very similar accuracies to what conventional survey crews using total stations or RTK GPS are able to produce. Now, I have another I've got another question asked about the data processing time. 
if the collection is 5% of the conventional. Uh, you know, we're generally on the back side of it in the office, and that's a, that's a very good question, but on the back side of all this, um, you know, field acquisition savings uh, is where you really realize cost savings on a project. Uh, the, the, the back office processing time of it are about are very similar, whether it be at a traditional method versus uh, in any combination of airborne, mobile, or terrestrial. So on the back side, they're very similar, but it's on the front end, you know, the, the data acquisition side, where you really re realize efficiencies and uh, in the data capture, and you can greatly reduce the cost for a as it relates to the project. And with that, that's the end of the, the presentation. And uh, I'm expecting Rob will now turn, Paul will turn this over to uh, Eric, and we can take questions at the end, or would we, we can take questions now, at whichever you fellows decide to do. Hello, this is Eric. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, Paul. Bear with me. Let me get this on the other screen. And then we can see your PowerPoint. You can see the PowerPoint. Okay. I didn't know which screen I was on. I'm sorry. There you go. Is that full screen, Paul? Yes, it is, Eric. Okay, great. Um, my name is Eric Andelin. I'm, I'm with Wolpert um, and here to discuss uh, mobile mapping, mobile LIDAR, and uh, the merging of data sets on a specific project, which was the Mixmaster here in Dallas. A uh, little bit of background. Um, the Mixmaster was designed in the 50s in, um, in uh, the southwest corner of Dallas. And, uh, you know, the, the technology and the types of vehicles that were driving on those roads back then, just uh, we've exceeded those capacities. So, um, so TechSoc came in and, and wanted to do a complete redesign of it. Um, and in INSO, uh, we're looking for opportunities to leverage data sets that they already had and um, provide um, a new comprehensive collection of the project area. A little bit about Wolpert, um, established in 1911. Um, we've been around for a little over 100 years. Um, approximately 650 employees, a uh, top 100, 100 AE design firm. Um, Full service, we do everything from airport planning to design to um, transportation work, utilities, survey, so forth. Um, myself uh, began in uh, 1984 in aerial photography, um, working for a family business. Uh, became a surveyor in the U.S. Army, surveyed, and uh, once I came out of survey, uh, the interest in aerial photography and surveying put together brought me into photogrammetry, uh, where I uh, received my certification in photogrammetry and also in GIS. Um, implementing and managing mobile LIDAR projects since really mobile LIDAR took off here in 2007-2008, um, in um, but working on LIDAR projects, you know, back to 2000. Um, DOTs that we've worked for, um, you know, highlighted in blue. Um, we've done a lot of projects across the country um, with a wide variety of, of uh, applications. Uh, the system we use is, is the same system as um, SAM uses, which is the Optech Lynx mobile LiDAR system. Um, 
Ours is the latest generation, which is called a, a M1. M1 stands for a million points a second. Um, so we, we have that additional uh, data density, shall we say. Um, the range is similar, 200-meter uh, range, although um, it, collects point out, it collects points out to that range. Um, we rarely use or see points out in that distance. Um, Sub-centimeter relative accuracies, around two centimeters absolute, and that's with control. Four integrated cameras, that was a, um, an upgrade with the M1 system, is that you could go to a four camera system. Uh, the benefit of that primarily is in asset type inventories. Um, we do find that uh, using imagery in combination with the LiDAR provides some benefits. And uh, there are certain software packages like, uh, for example, TopoDot that, that really stress um, the use of imagery in the extraction process. Um, another benefit of the M1 system is the real-time point cloud viewing. So um, the person in the field that's collecting the data is actually seeing a percentage of those points visually as they're collecting them. We also have the ability to adjust density. So if, for example, um, we want to do just a road project and conserve the amount of data collected, we would literally just turn on or scan in those areas and have it leave the remaining areas above you blank. Um, it's an option. It's not an option that we use all the time, but if, if it's needed, it's there. Um, the link system is configured to look something like this or have these components. Um, you've got an operator interface. You've got a control box, which contains the, um, um, the, the controllers and the hard drives. You've got an IMU that's in the control box. You've got two GPS units with, uh, with the Optech system, up front and rear. Um, you also have two sensors and four digital cameras. And then, of course, um, as a backup, you've got a DMI wheel sensor. This is what our system looks like on our van. Um, doing a project in Indianapolis. Um, one of the things we like to do is keep our sensors up as high as possible. Um, so we built a rack that's um, exclusively done to raise those sensors. Um, and in this case, we're doing a project where we're doing asset management. So we have moved the forward camera up to the front of the vehicle uh, to, keep the, to keep the van out of the images. Um, system configuration, again, you've got two sensors, two cameras, and one of the GPS units on top. Um, this one's not, well, actually it is. Everything's plugged in. So um, you see a cable there down in the lower part of the screen running down into the um, top of the van. Um, of course, you know, for safety, you've got flashing devices on all the lights. Um, and as Keith pointed out, and as I'll point out again, one of the biggest benefits of mobile LiDAR is that you are driving at highway or street speeds. So you're not causing any disruption in traffic. Accuracies, um, again, uh, without ground control but good satellite data, you're probably hitting around two tenths. Um, that's a good satellite data. Um, no ground control and poor satellite data, you're looking at your, your foot or more. Um, so you know, depending on what your project is, um, you, your accuracies have to be considered for that. Um, with the benefit of ground control, um, we're usually around 600 to the foot. Um, we can go better than that. It just takes more control. And, and what's that added cost worth um, to you, the person doing the project? Little explanation, um, absolute and relative accuracies. Absolute, of course, is uh, to the control. So where am I at in relation to the control? The relative accuracy is what's the distance between two points. Um, so if you want to get your bridge heights or your bridge clearances, if that's what's uh, driving the project, relative accuracy is what's important there. Um, so you could you know, perhaps replace linear referencing with something like mobile LiDAR to do that type of work. Comprehensive collection, that's, um, that's what we all enjoy about mobile LiDAR. Um, we're catching the road surface. 
for catching the lane markings, the guardrails, the substructure, support columns, signage, more signage, all of that in one collect. Some of the projects we've worked on, um, again, spanning the, the continental U.S. and actually over in Hawaii as well, um, are some of the larger ones out there. And, um, you know, it, it takes a, a forward-thinking organization to not only uh, work and purchase, with this, purchase this equipment um, and put their time into it, but it also takes a design company um, that, that has, um, you know, such as h and that might have an, H &T, uh, an incubation group that does uh, a lot of research on this data and, and really helps prove this out. In this case, um, we're talking about the um, Project Pegasus, a specific portion of it called the Mixmaster. Um, Wolpert uh, purchased Bohan in Houston about two years ago. Bohan in Houston's history with Project Pegasus goes 10, 15 years back to some of the original laser scanning for text dots. Um, and some of those images on the right are from uh, the original laser scanners. Ironically, we were able to incorporate those into this project. Um, this is an overhead shot of the Mixmaster area. Total length is about four and a half, five miles, but um, drive length is more like 18 miles when you start adding all of the lanes that you're collecting and so forth. This is an example of all the LIDAR data that was captured um, within that project area. Um, this was a data fusion project, so we had an existing autocorrelated surface of the entire area, which we used off of road. We have mobile LIDAR, which we were collected, which was collected in this contract. We had existing terrestrial LIDAR um, from years back, and we also had new terrestrial LIDAR, actually over 600 scans, underneath some of the bridge columns and, columns and support structures that were A, either not visible in the autocorrelated surface, or B, not visible in the mobile LIDAR data based on the position of the system. And these are some examples of the type of data that we um, created from the LIDAR. As you can see, um, the LIDAR is overlaying on some CAD work. Uh, this one actually shows how many drive paths there were. Each one is color-coded differently. Um, one of the things that um, is always a challenge with mobile LIDAR is, is uh, multiple drive path collects. Um, it's not as simple as one run down the center of the road. Um, you usually have to do more than one pass, and when you're integrating all of those together, that's where the challenge really becomes, um, where it really becomes a challenge. This is some, another example. This is actually some of the mobile LIDAR data laid over the contours developed from the autocorrelated surface. Um, here we've got some terrestrial scanning. So we've got the CAD data, and then the terrestrial scanning was actually underneath the bridge columns. Um, for example, when we went over the Trinity River, vehicles weren't allowed down in there. Um, one, the Corps wouldn't allow us down there. Two, our van would get stuck if we tried to take it down there. So we did a lot of terrestrial scanning across that span. Um, I do believe there's also aerial LIDAR data of that area that might have been created by CH2 and Hill, although I don't think we incorporated it into this project. Here's the same area with the mobile scan across the top. So you can see we're still getting stuff underneath, but we may not be getting the type of density that's needed to build those bridge columns. And a lot of this project was modeling of those columns. Here we've got the combined data set um, for a more comprehensive coverage. Again, some examples of the mobile LIDAR data. And I think what we'd like to point out here is the type of density with which we're getting in the mobile LIDAR data that you can see that actual paint striping work. And that becomes important when you are using stuff like TopoDot, um, where you, for example, want to use automated uh, paint line extraction. Um, if you have that type of density, you're going to achieve some good results. 
Um, I, I see a question up there asking about which software we use to extract. Um, we use every piece of software that's available to extract. Um, Topodot's great when we have imagery. Um, it's, it's great for cutting cross sections, um, but we also work directly in MicroStation. Um, we also work in a 3D environment with, um, with uh, Cardinal Systems. So it kind of depends on what the deliverable on the project is. Here's another example of the type of detail we're receiving from the uh, mobile LiDAR data. And this is actually, uh, it's actually two drive paths and there's a seam line um, right down the center there where the two come together. And here, here's some examples, and this is the big challenge, and pro pro probably Paul could tell you more about this, but this is a big challenge with the Pegasus project. They've got some viaducts across um, this project, which um, they are requiring all of the redevelopment to go through, not over, not under, but through. Um, so it's, it's created quite a challenge for the designers to work on this. Um, there's a question about did we experience any inconsistencies with the mobile LiDAR unit that you can attribute to live wind loads on the structures. Actually, um, the, the accuracy requirement was, shall we say, loosened a little bit by TxDOT because of these structures. Um, the accuracy requirement was a tenth of a foot. Um, we did not experience a whole lot of, of uh, shall we say, challenges with the mobile LiDAR because of that. Um, our bigger challenge in this case was there are something like 30,000 vehicles an hour running through that area, and um, they are not exactly going the speed limit when they go through there. So we had to add, follow, had to add a follow vehicle to this project, um, and even then it was quite a challenge. This is actually some of the terrestrial scan data that was performed you know, close to 10 years ago. Um, and we kind of used it more as a, as a match to see how the new data was looking um, on the project. This is a more high resolution um, image of some of the data that was collected and some of the simple basic modeling that was performed for TxDOT on our end. Um, as you can see, the point cloud is laid over the top. Here's another example, again, as we had talked about previously, where they're color-coded based on drive path. The solid areas, the blue and the yellow, are where terrestrial LiDAR data had been incorporated. And then we've got some modeling as well. I, if I didn't quote it, I believe the number was 600 bridge columns in this area. So it's quite a bit of work. Here's some examples of the power lines that were captured um, in the area. Um, not, not required as part of the project, but this is part of the reason our designers that we're working with want this data, because it may not be part of the project now, but it's going to help them when they're doing their avoidance um, as they're doing the design. More examples. Um, Overhead clearances, again, similar to, um, similar to the, the overhead uh, power lines, uh, a benefit that comes from the mobile LiDAR data. Um, not a deliverable on this project, but something I'm certain that the designers were, were able to use. Um, we did do clearances. Um, primarily, those are bridge clearances, but we've collected um, some other clearances as well. Again, this is based on the relative. There's actually some, uh, pulling this information out is, um, is not that tough of a challenge. Once you've got it collected and controlled properly, um, and you can work in this stuff in a, a pseudo 3D environment or a 3D environment, you can really pull out a lot of information quickly. Again, some of the LiDAR data over the bridge structures or the viaducts. This, these were for clearances. This is the entire area from the autocorrelated surface. And you can see the autocorrelated surface is the, the blue dots that almost look like a mesh um, that came from the photography, I believe it was 2007. Um, 
you could see some LIDAR data in red. That was originally captured, again, over 10 years ago. Um, and then the voids, of course, are the black areas, uh, which is why we came back in um, and, and did mobile LIDAR you know, on this more recent project. The example of the mixed master area is a mesh. Um, some of the modeling that was done from that LIDAR data. And this is actually, to, to go a little bit deeper into it, this is actually the sample area that we did um, for the designers uh, to as a proof of concept for the DOT. Again, one of the deliverables were bridge cross sections. And as you see in the bottom half of the screen, we were able to um, pull cross sections. Example of some of the, um, uh, the density of the LIDAR or the thickness of the LIDAR data collected. And then some more of the, the uh, deliverables that you can gain from this. You've got on the far left, you've got uh, bridge contours, half foot, just the bridge only. Um, you've got the ground below it in the next frame. And then you've got the two combined. Here we go with some more modeling and contouring. And then the planimetric deal, detail, again, that may not have been collect, collected by the mobile LIDAR, but had been collected from the previous aerial photography and the photogrammetry we just incorporated into this project. These are actually some of the uh, models that were designed from HNTB from this data set. Um, I've got a few clips here. Uh, this is the redesign of what the MixMaster will look like. And some example, an example of of what HNTB was able to do with um, where they're going to uh, uh, redesign this these super elevations, and then a, a, an overview again of something similar. Then just to throw in a, a few slides on other advantages of mobile LIDAR. Obviously, if you've got colorized point clouds, um, as is the case here, or images with point clouds overlaid, um, you've got additional information. This was actually I-30 coming into um, the MixMaster on a previous project. And uh, the line work overlaid on the imagery, um, this, this imagery, again, is collected at the same time that the LIDAR data is collected. We calibrate the images back to the point cloud. Again, some point cloud or some line work from the point cloud overlaid on the imagery. Same scene on the LIDAR data. Of course, um, you can collect road cloth cross falls. Um, you do your slope calculations. You can compute. Um, uh, scan points from pavement to create the surface model. Um, you can auto-calc radius of curvature, um, then be able to do super elevation. Line of sight and view shed. Um, you know, uh, this is a benefit when you've got a lot of vegetation obstructing your intersections. Um, you can pull line of sight from this information. And here's an example of actually vegetation encroachment on LIDAR data. And as we turn on or model the features, we can then isolate out those uh, features or vegetation that are encroaching on these power lines. Here's an example of the um, imagery. Uh, displayed in MicroStation and or AutoCAD. Um, and you can see down in the lower frame, we actually build a model back to the focal point of the camera. This is, um, Keith had mentioned a little bit about um, voids in the data. And for example, under a bridge, you have a void. Well, in LiDAR data, you, have, you do have voids based on the way the scanner is collecting information. And a lot of times, um, to get that information, 
prior to the project deliverable, um, the surveyor can use that to go in and fill in those voided areas. And one of the things we provide our clients as part of the LIDAR data, when we tile the LIDAR data, we also create what we call intensity orthos. And we provide those to our surveyors so they can look at it and determine if there's a black area, there's a void, and they can get out in the field and supplement that area with, with field survey information. So it keeps their work going on their side of the project while we're finishing our deliverables. Here's an example of, of the imagery um, actually collecting data on top of the imagery and it falling back to the point cloud. We've actually taken our LIDAR, our, our imagery, and geo-referenced it so we can actually place that imagery in, for example, Google Earth. It'll match what's there. Actually, be more accurate than that. Um, we can place cameras in a downward position off the rear of the vehicle and create colorized orthos from the images. Now the challenge with those are is that they're very small images. So color balancing um, at this point is, is too, much, um, too much to ask for. Uh, but it still does give you a very accurate representation of what is on the ground. Sign inventories. Um, we're actually in the process of doing a very large sign inventory for the city of Indianapolis. Um, some of the things that we're doing is um, automated recognition of actual signs. Um, we do some recognition of, of uh, uh, naming conventions as well. We're working on, uh, we actually do some smart feature extraction. Um, what we do is we teach through image recognition, we teach the software to go out and find signs for us. Um, and from that sign, from that image, it will find the same information in the point cloud. Um, completing a lot of what we, what we have as MUTCD uh, requirements um, automated from the point cloud. This is an example of it capturing uh, a parking sign. Uh, we did a parking meter project in, in uh, Chicago where we sent it out and trained it to find all of the parking meters and then it runs through the data and captures just that information for us. So it's limitless what you can do with LIDAR data and when you include imagery, um, you add that much more to it. Um, obstructions, sidewalks, ADA ramps, pavement analysis, um, anything that you can see in the LIDAR data you can pull out of the LIDAR data. The challenge is, is how do you pull it out um, quickly and how do you pull it out um, you know, in a manner that the client is looking for. For example, in Indianapolis, the deliverable for this product project is a database that's going to go into a GIS. We're just using LIDAR to fill that database. Um, I see a question about time and cost savings compared to traditional surveying occurred as a result of using LIDAR on the MixMaster. Um, I would say the biggest benefit of collecting with mobile LIDAR on the MixMaster is the question of danger to the surveyors. Um, unfortunately, TechSot lost a surveyor probably two weeks before we started this project on another highway. Um, and as I had mentioned, the challenge of actually collecting that data at highway speed was was great enough, but to actually put surveyors out there on those superstructures um, was just not something that TechDOT was willing to do. Um, there was quite a bit of survey in this project. I think we had about 180 control points um, across the span of this project. And again, we had terrestrial crews off of pavement um, collecting terrestrial LIDAR. We also had um, a subcontractor that was doing all of the utility locates and so forth um, off of pavement. So there was quite a bit of survey going on. Um, it just wasn't on paved surfaces. Um, time and cost savings. Um, I, I can talk about cost savings a little bit in relation to accuracy. Um, when this project was first proposed, the accuracy was going to be around 500 of a foot. Um, when uh, the contract came out and the DOT decided what they really wanted, 
um, the accuracy spec was loosened up to about a tenth of a foot. In that change alone, it saved about $150,000 worth of survey costs on the project. So again, how much is two tenths of a foot or two hundredths of a foot, um, how important is that to your project? This is an example of the vehicle that TxDOT used to verify the accuracy of the data on the project. Um, in this case, uh, the North Region, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the North Region likes to use um, just a dual GPS receiver vehicle that collects data and looks for uh, variance between the point cloud and the GPS data that it's collected. Um, and uh, I, I see this vehicle running around. I live in the area, so I see it running around quite a bit. Conclusion, um, complete comprehensive collection. You may not need it now, but you might want it later. Um, Robert, I think you put the question out there, does adverse weather affect the scanning? Uh, absolutely. Um, we cannot scan in wet weather uh, because we'll receive no intensity return. Um, also, ponding will actually shift the data, so kind of like a prism effect. So we don't collect in wet weather. Um, Wind doesn't really bother us. Uh, light condition is important, especially if we're collecting uh, data that it requires imagery. Fortunately, on the Mixmaster, that was um, one of the challenges that we didn't have to face. In order to collect the data as fast as possible, the client asked that we forego the imagery and just get the LiDAR data. So we collected everything at night. So with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Paul. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to discuss this with you. Thanks very much, Eric. That was a very compelling presentation. And thank you, Keith, also. Uh, very, very impressive uh, project work that you guys are performing. I know from HNT, HNTB's perspective, we, uh, we really uh, appreciate all the efforts that uh, folks like yourselves are, are going forth and doing and showing us how we can use the technology uh, in so many different ways, and I know, uh, you know we've we found that, uh, especially in the design build arena, you know, the speed at which uh, these these types of acquisitions can happen, and the results uh, can be presented uh, much sooner. I think uh, Keith showed the number of days that you can save in the field. Uh, that's critical uh, in design build, and you know we're always worried about the schedule. So uh, if we can improve safety, keep the, keep our accuracies the same, and speed up the operation, I think everyone on the project. Uh, can benefit from that. So uh, I don't know if either uh, Eric or Keith have any final thoughts. Uh, I'll certainly uh, give you guys the, the floor to, to add anything, and then we'll turn it back over to Robert. Well, this is Keith. I'd like to just ask, answer a couple of questions that were asked earlier in my presentation. One sure. question was, uh, what, what microstation file uh, was developed from the extraction data? Uh, as a service provider, we're, you know, I, most of you all are probably aware that the LiDAR data sets are very large uh, sets of data, but, and that's not very useful to, to our end users. We're, we're, we're more focused on, you know, how our clients going to use this data. So to that end, in the transportation industry, standard software deliverable is going to be a microstation uh, 2D file and a 3D file. The SH349 project was developed in microstation version 8. And so we use the TxDOT seed files and the, 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 you know, their standard seed files and deliver 2D and 3D files. Although now we're, we're, some of the districts we're working for use V8i. Then there was another question about how much of the utility SAG height data is available. Um, I would say that, as I mentioned in the presentation, the quarter width that we were able to capture was a function of the height that, that their, the aircraft was operating at. So essentially, we had an 850 foot plus or minus um, corridor data of which we only extracted 200. So to answer the question, we had about an additional 600 to 650 feet of, of LIDAR data, which included that crossing information for a, either distribution or transmission lines. And then uh, I think there was another about softwares in general uh, for, for uh, planet stereo imagery and such. Uh, the softwares we use, uh, processing of LIDAR, uh, be it mobile, terrestrial, or airborne. Generally, they're a combination of softwares, as Eric stated, kind of use everything, but 
Um, Topodot is one of those products. It integrates suite of softwares for the on the photogrammetry side, and then of course MicroStation using the Terra solid Terra scan products uh, as well. And then kind of to sum up, my, my final thoughts are, uh, as you can see, there's there's a to the to the audience there's a number of technologies that are out there, and uh, what we as a service provider uh, have to be able to provide to you from our perspective is the right tool for the job. And that means the right tool or combination of tools, as you can see from the projects that both Eric and I spoke to, uh, the combination of technologies. Uh, it just it would appear that there's just not one technology that get, gets you everything that you need, but having the, the expertise and, and the knowledge on how to integrate data that's collected from various, with various tools is a, a very important skill set for a service provider to have. Yeah, I, I would add to that that, um, you know, a lot of what we're coming across now are hybrid solutions where, um, for example, Keith might be out collecting data with his, his helicopter system, but he might need um, higher accuracy information as the roads cross underneath. He may send his mobile system out there to collect that information. Um, we, we quite often um, will collect terrestrial scan data under bridge supports um, just because the level of detail might be a little bit higher than the mobile LIDAR system can capture um, because of the speeds that we're driving. So um, there was another question as to whether or not we can take the vehicle off-road. Um, absolutely, um, the versatility of, of the Optech system is that you can move it from one vehicle to another. Um, we have actually scanned rivers with our system on the back of a boat. So um, it does have that versatility. And with that, I would add one thing is that if we do go off-road with our vehicle, we do have another issue that would be weather-related, and that is if we're kicking up dust off the back of that vehicle, then the LIDAR is not going to penetrate that dust. So that can create a challenge. I know it I created a lot of challenges over in Afghanistan when people were testing those systems out. But um, yes, we've had it on gators, we've had it on boats. Um, the only thing we haven't done is turned it upside down and stick it on a helicopter yet. Well, Paul, this is, uh, this is Rob Dingus, uh, president of the Geospatial Transportation Mapping Association. Let me just take a moment and thank Eric and Keith and, and Paul, again, for the, the, the presentations today, these companies are obviously pushing the frontiers as it relates to uh, geospatial mapping and its application to transportation. Just a quick note for those of you on the, uh, on the webinar. On October 17th, we will have the next in this series of webinars uh, with the Utah Department of Transportation. Uh, we have a couple of uh, gentlemen from the Utah Department of Transportation who will be discussing their asset management program. They're doing a network collection of their, of their state system, and they're going to talk about it from a DOT perspective as to why they're doing this, what they're looking for as it relates to safety, to collecting the assets, and even to some of the survey type applications that we've heard of today. So with that, I would uh, thank everyone for, again for their participation and uh, bring this webinar to a close. Thank you all. Thank you.